More than a decade ago, the team at Wikibon coined the term server sand. We saw the opportunity to dramatically change the storage infrastructure layer and predicted a major change in technologies that would hit the market. Server sand had three fundamental attributes. First of all, it was software led. So all the traditionally expensive controller functions like snapshots and clones and dedupe and replication, compression, encryption, et cetera, they were done in software, directly challenging a two to three decade long storage controller paradigm. The second principle was it leveraged and shared storage inside of servers. And the third, it enabled an any to any topology between servers and storage. Now, at the time we defined this coming trend in a relatively narrow sense inside of a data center location, for example. But in the past decade, two additional major trends have emerged. First, the software defined data center became the dominant model thanks to VMware and others. And while this eliminated a lot of overhead, it also exposed another problem. Specifically data centers today allocate probably we estimate around 35% of CPU cores and cycles to managing things like storage and network and security, offloading those functions, this is wasted cores. And doing this with traditional general purpose x86 processors is expensive and it's not efficient. This is why we've been reporting so aggressively on arms ascendancy into the enterprise. It's not only like coming, it's here. And we're going to talk about that today. The second mega trend is cloud computing. Hyperscale infrastructure has allowed technology companies to put a management and control plane into the cloud and expand beyond our narrow service and scope within a single data center and support the management of distributed data at massive scale. And today we're on the cusp of a new era of innovation of, of infrastructure and one of the startups in this space is Nebulon. Hello everybody, this is Dave Vellante and welcome to this CUBE conversation where we welcome in two great guests, Craig Nunez, CUBE alum, co-founder and COO at Nebulon and Tobias Fish, Fish, who's director of product management at Nebulon. Guys, welcome, great to see you. So good to be here, Dave. It's, yeah. uh, it uh, feels awesome. Soon face to face, Craig. I'm, I'm heading your way this before I the fall. I can't wait. So. All right, Craig, right. you heard my narrative up front. Uh, and I'm wondering, yep. are those the trends that you guys saw when you, when you started the company? What are the major shifts in the world today that, that caused yeah. you and your co-founders to launch Nebulon? Yeah, I'll give you sort of the way we, we think about the world, which I think uh, aligns super right with, with what you're talking about. You know, over the last several years, organizations have had a great deal of experience with public cloud data centers. And uh, I think like any uh, platform or technology that is, you know, gets its use in a variety of ways, you know, a bit of savvy is being developed by organizations on, you know, where, what do I put where, how do I manage things um, in the most efficient way possible? And the, there are, in terms of the, the uh, types of folks we're focused on, in Nebulon's business, um, we see now kind of three groups of uh, people emerging, and and we uh, sort of simply uh, coined three terms: the the returners, the removers, and the remainers. And I'll explain what I mean by each of those. The returners um, are folks who maybe early on, you know, hit the gas on cloud, moved you know everything in a lot in and realize that mm, while it's you know awesome for some things for other things it was less optimal maybe cost became a factor or uh, visibility into what was going on with their data was a factor security service levels whatever and they've decided to move some of those workloads back returners the there are what i call the removers that are taking workloads from you know born in the cloud on-prem, uh, you know, and this was talked a lot about in, in Martin's blog that, uh, you know, talked about a lot of the growth companies that built up such a large footprint in the public cloud that economics were kind of working against them. You know, you can, depending on the knobs you turn, you know, it you're probably spending, hmm, you know, uh, two and a half X, two X, what you might spend if you owned your own factory and, and you can argue about, you know, where your leverage is in negotiating your, your pricing with, with the cloud vendors, but there's a big gap. The, the last one is, and I think probably the most significant 
uh, in terms of who who we've engaged with is the remainers and the remainers are you know hybrid IT organizations they've got assets in the cloud and on prem um, they aspire to an operational model that is consistent across everything and you know leveraging all the best stuff that they uh, observe in their cloud based um, uh, assets and and it's kind of our view that frankly we take from from this constituency that that you know when people talk about cloud or, or cloud first they're moving to something that is really more an operating model versus a destination or data center choice and so you know we get people on the phone every day talking about cloud first and with when you kind of dig into what they're after it's operating model characteristics not which which data center do i put it in and those those decisions are are separating and so that you know it's really that focus for us is where you know we believe we're doing something unique for that group of customers yeah cloud first doesn't doesn't mean cloud only and and of course right. followers of this program know we talk a lot about this this, this the definition of cloud is changing, it's evolving, it's moving to the edge, it's moving to data centers, data centers are moving to the cloud, cross cloud, it's that big layer that's expanding. And so I think the definition of cloud, even in, particularly in customers' minds is, is evolving. There's no question about it. People, they'll, they'll, they'll look at what VMware's doing in, in AWS and say, okay, that's cloud. But they'll also look at things like VMware Cloud Foundation and say, oh yeah, that's cloud too. So it's, to me, the, the, the beauty of cloud is in, in the eye of the customer beholder. So I, I buy that. Yeah. Um, Tobias, yeah. I wonder if you could talk about how this all translates into product, because you guys are a startup, you got to sell stuff. You, got, you use this term smart infrastructure. You know, what is that? How, how does this all turn into stuff you can sell? Right, yeah, so, so let, me, let me back up a little bit and, and, and talk a little bit about, you know, what we at Nebulon do. So, we're Nebula, we are a cloud-based software company and we're, we're delivering sort of a, a new category of, of smart infrastructure. And you, if you think about things that you would know from your, your everyday, you know, uh, for every, everyday uh, surroundings, smart infrastructure is really all around us. Think um, smart home technology like uh, Google Nest um, as an example. And what this all has in common is that there's um, a cloud control plane um, that is managing some IoT endpoints and smart devices in, you know, in various loca locations. And um, by doing that, customers um, gain um, gain benefits like um, easy remote management. Right, you can manage your, your thermostat, your your temperature from from anywhere in the world. Basically, um, you don't have to worry about automated software updates anymore. Um, and you can, you know, easily automate your 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 home, your infrastructure, right, um, um, through this cloud control plane. And um, translating this idea to to IT infrastructure, to the data center, right. Um, this idea is not necessarily new, right. Um, if you look into the the networking space with uh, Meraki ne Networks, uh, now Cisco, or uh, uh, MIS Systems now now uh, Juniper. Um, they've really pioneered efforts in in cloud management, so smart uh, network infrastructure, and and the key problem that they solved there is you know managing these vast amount of access points and switches that are scattered across the data centers, uh, across campuses and and you know the data center. Um, now, um, if you if you if you translate that to what Nebulon does, it's really applying. Um, the smart infrastructure idea, this methodology to application infrastructure, specifically to to compute and 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 storage um, infrastructure, and that's essentially uh, that's essentially what we're what we're doing. Um, so, with smart infrastructure, um, basically our offering at, at Nebulon, the product uh, that comes with uh, the benefits of this cloud experience a public cloud operating model, as we've talked about, you know, um, some of our customers look at the cloud as an operating model, uh, model rather than a, a destination, a physical location. And with that, we bring this, this model, this, this experience, this operating uh, model to on-premises application infrastructure. Um, and, and really what you get with this, pro uh, with this, with this offering from Nebulon um, 
and the, and the benefits are really circling around you know four four areas. First of all, um, rapid time to value, right? So application owners think people that are not specialists or or or, or, or you know experts when it comes to IT uh, infrastructure, um, but more generalists. They can provision on-premise application infrastructure in in just less than 10 minutes, right? It can go from from just bare metal physical racks to the full application stack um, in less than 10 minutes. So they're up and running a lot quicker, and they can immediately deliver services um, to their end customers. Cloud-like operations, this um, this notion of zero touch remote management, which now the last couple of of, of months uh, with this uh, strange time that we're in with COVID is you know, turnout is, is becoming more and more relevant, really, um, as in uh, remotely administrating and management uh, of infrastructure that scales from just hundreds of nodes to thousands of nodes, uh, doesn't really matter, with uh, behind the scenes software updates, uh, with um, global uh, AI analytics and insights, and basically overall, you know, combined reduce the operational overhead when it comes to on-premises infrastructure by up to 75%, right? Um, the other thing um, is support for any application, whether it's containerized, virtualized, or, or even bare metal applications. And, and the, idea, the idea here is really consistent um, uh, leveraging server-based um, um, storage um, that doesn't require any Nebulon specific software on the server. So you get the full power of your application servers for your applications, um, you know, as the service intended. And then, and then the first, the fourth benefit um, um, when it comes to smart infrastructure is, is of course doing this all at a lower cost and with better data center density. Um, and that is really comparing it to three tier architectures where you have your server, uh, you have your your sand fabric, and then you have an you know external storage array. But also, when you compare it with hyperconverged infrastructure software, right, that is consuming um, resources of the application servers, think CPU, think memory, uh, and networking. So, so basically, um, you get a lot more density um, with that approach um, um, compared to those uh, those architectures. Okay. Okay, I want to dig into some of that differentiation too. But what what do I what exactly do I buy from you? Do I buy a software subscription? Uh, is that right? Can you explain that a little bit? Right. So um, basically, um, the way we do this is is really uh, leveraging two uh, key new innovations, right? So, and you see why I made the, the the bridge to smart home technology because the approach is similar, right? The one is. Um, you know, the introduction of a cloud control plane um, that basically manages on-premises application infrastructure. And of course that is delivered to customers as a service. The second one is, um, you know, the, a new infrastructure model that, that uses um, IOT um, endpoint technology. And that is embedded into standard application servers um, and, and the storage within this um, application uh, service. Um, let me add a couple of words to that, so you know, it, it, to explain that a little bit more. So, really, at the heart of um, smart infrastructure, and in, in order to deliver this this public cloud experience for any on-prem application, is this cloud-based control plane, right? So, we've built this um, how we recommend our customers to use uh, public cloud, and that is built, you know, building your 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 software on modern technologies that are vendor agnostic, um, so it could essentially run anywhere, whether it is, um, you know, any public cloud vendor, or if we wanted to run in our own data centers when uh, regulatory requirements change. Um, it's massively scalable and responsive, no matter how large uh, the managed infrastructure is. Um, but really the, the, the interesting part here, Dave, is that the customer doesn't really um, have to worry about any of that. It's delivered as a service. Right? So what a customer gets from this cloud control plane is a single API endpoint, how they get it with a public cloud, right? Um, they get a web user interface, uh, which from which they can manage all of their infrastructure, no matter how many devices, no matter where it is, can be in a data center, can be in an edge location and in the world. Um, they get template-based provisioning, much like a marketplace in a public cloud. They get analytics, uh, predictive support services, and super easy automation capabilities. Now, the second thing that I mentioned is this um, server embedded 
software, the server embedded infrastructure software, um, and that is running on a PCIe um, um, based um, offload engine. And that is really acting as this managed IoT endpoint within the application server that I managed uh, that I mentioned earlier. Um, and, and that approach really uh, further converges uh, modern application infrastructure and, and it really replaces the software defined storage uh, approach that you'll find in hyper converged infrastructure software. And, and that is really by embedding the, the data services, the, the, the storage data service into silicon within the server. Now this offload engine, we call that a, a, a services processing unit or SPU in short. And, and that is really what differentiates us from, um, uh, from, from uh, uh, hyper-converged infrastructure. Um, and it's, it's quite different than an, a regular accelerator card that you get with some of the hyper-converged uh, infrastructure offerings. And it's different in the sense that the SPU runs basically all of uh, the shared and, and local data services. And it's not just accelerating individual algorithms, individual functions, and it basically provides all of these, these services um, uh, uh, as, aside the CPU uh, with um, uh, the boot drive, with data drives, and in, in essence provides you with this uh, separate fault domain from the server. So for example, if you reboot your server, the data plan remains intact. Um, you know, it's not impacted for that. Okay. Okay. So I want to stand that for just a second, Craig, if I could, I mean, I get Mm -hmm. uh, very clear how you're different from the, as Tobias said, the three tier server, sand fabric, external array. Mm -hmm. The HCI thing's interesting uh, because I th in some respects, the HCI is, you know, guys take Nutanix to talk about cloud and becoming more friendly with developers and the API piece. But, but what's your point of view, Craig, on, yeah. on how you position relative to say HCI? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So the so everyone gets what three tier architecture is and was, um, and and HCI software, you know, emerged as an alternative to the three tier architectures. Uh, everyone, I think, today understands that data services are you know SDS is software hosted in the operating system um, of each HCI device and consume some amount of CPU memory network, whatever. And it's typically constrained to a hypervisor environment is, you know, kind of where, where most of the, uh, uh, that stuff is done. And, and over time, these platforms have added some monitoring capabilities, predictive analytics, typically provided by the vendors cloud. Right. And, and as Tobias mentioned, some, um, HCIS vendors have augmented this approach by adding an accelerator to make things like compression and dedupe go faster, right? Think SimpliVity or something like that. Um, the, you know, the difference uh, that, that we're talking about here is, you know, the, the infrastructure software um, that we deliver as a service is embedded right into server silicon. So it's not sitting in the operating system uh, of choice. And what that means is you get the full power of the you know server you bought for your workloads. Um, it's not constrained to a hypervisor only environment. Um, it's uh, OS agnostic. And you know it's it's entirely controlled uh, and administered by the cloud um, versus um, with, you know, most HCIS is an on-prem console that manages a cluster or, or two on-prem. And, you know, think of it from a automation perspective, when you automate something, you've got to, you know, set up your, your playbook kind of cluster by cluster and depending what versions they're on, APIs are changing, behaviors are changing. So a very different approach at scale. And so, so again, for us, we're talking about something that gives you um, uh, a much more efficient infrastructure that is then you know, managed by the cloud and, and gives you this full kind of operational model you would expect um, for any kind of uh, cloud-based deployment. You know, um, 
I got to go back. You guys obviously have some three-par DNA hanging around. And you know, remember, of course, you remember well the three-par ASIC. It was kind of famous at the time, and it was unique. And I, and I bring that up only because you, you, you've mentioned a couple of times the silicon. And a lot of people say, yeah, whatever. But we have been on this, especially, particularly with ARM. And I, I want to share with the audience, and if you follow my breaking analysis, you know this. If you look at the historical curve of Moore's law with x86, it's you know, the doubling of performance every two years, roughly. That comes out to about 40% a year. That's moderated down to about 30% a year now. If you look at the ARM ecosystem and take, for instance, Apple A, A15 in the previous series, for example, over the last five years, the performance when you combine the, G, the CPU, GPU, NPU, the accelerators, the DSPs, which by the way, are all customizable, that's growing at 110% a year. And that the SOC costs 50 bucks. So my point is, that you guys are riding a perfect example of doing offloads with a way more efficient architecture that's going to, you're now on that curve that's growing at 100% plus mm -hmm. per year, whereas a lot of the legacy storage is still on that 30% a year curve. Yeah. And so yeah. cheaper, lower power, that's why I love Tobias, you were bringing in the IOT and the smart infrastructure. This is the future of storage and, mm -hmm. and infrastructure. Infrastructure, yeah. absolutely. It's and and the thing I would emphasize is it's not limited to storage. Right. Storage is a is a big issue, but we're talking about your application infrastructure. And you you brought up something interesting on the um, the DPU, the smart NIC uh, side of things. And just to kind of you know level set with with everybody, there there's you know there's the HCI world. And then there's this smart NIC, DPU world, whatever you want to call it, but it's effectively a network card. It's got that specialized processing um, on board and firmware to provide some, you know, network security storage services. And think of it as a PCIe card in your server. It connects to an external storage system. So think NVIDIA Bluefield 2 connecting to an external NVMe storage device. And the, the interesting thing about that is, you know, storage processing is offloaded from the server. So as we said earlier, good, right? You get the server back to your application, but storage moves out of the server. Um, and, you know, it starts to look a little bit like an external storage approach versus a server-based approach. And, and infrastructure management is done by you know the server smart NIC with some monitoring and analytics coming from you know your supplier's cloud support service. So so complexity creeps back in if you start to lose that you know heavily converged approach. Um, again, we you know we are taking advantage of storage within the server and th and the you know keeping this a, a, a real server based approach but distinguishing ourselves from the HCI approach because there's a real ROI there. Um, and when we talk to you know, folks who are looking at new and different ways, we talk a lot about the cloud and I think we've done a, a, a bit of that already. But then at the end of the day, folks are trying to figure out, well, okay, but then what do I buy to enable this? And what you buy is your standard server recipe, um, so think your favorite HPE, Lenovo, Supermicro, whatever the whatever your brand, um, and it's going to come enabled with this IoT endpoint within it. So it's really a smart server, uh, if you will, that can then be controlled by our cloud. And so you're effectively buying a you know from your favorite server vendor, a server option that is this endpoint, and a subscription. You don't buy any of this from us, by the way. It's all coming from them. And that's the, uh, the way we uh, deliver this. And I, yeah. I, you know, not sorry to get into the plumbing, but this is something we've been on and are fascinated with. Is that, is that silicon custom designed or is it pretty much off the shelf? Do you guys adding any value no. to it? No, there are off the shelf options that can deliver tremendous horsepower uh, on that form factor. And, uh, and so we take advantage of that um, to you know, do what we do um, uh, in terms of you know creating these sort of smart servers with our endpoint, and so that's where we're at. Yeah, awesome. So guys, 
What's your sweet spot? You know, why are customers, you know, what, what are you seeing? Customers adopting, maybe some examples you guys can share? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So the, um, I think Tobias mentioned that because of the architectural approach, there's a lot of flexibility there. You can run, you know, virtualized, containerized, bare metal applications. Um, the, you know, the question is uh, where are folks choosing to get started. And those, those use cases with our existing customers revolve heavily around uh, virtual, virtualization modernization. So they're going back in to their virtualized environment, whether their existing infrastructure is array based or HCI based, and they're looking to streamline that, save money, automate more, the usual things. Um, the second uh, um, area is the distributed edge. You know the edge is going through tremendous transformation uh, with, with IoT devices, uh, 5G, and trying to get processing closer to you know, where customers are doing work. And so that distributed edge is a real uh, opportunity because again, it's a, it's a, a more cost-effective, more dense infrastructure and the you know the cloud effectively can manage across all of these sites through a single uh, you know a single API. The um, and then the third area is cloud service provider transformation. We do a fair bit of business with you know cloud service provider CTOs who are looking at you know trying to build top line growth, trying to create new services and, and drive better bottom line. And so this is, uh, you know, really a, you know, as much as a revenue uh, opportunity for them as cost saving opportunity. And then the the last one is uh, this this uh, notion of, you know, bringing the cloud on prem. We've done a, a, a cloud repatriation deal, um, and I know you're you've seen a little of that, but maybe not a lot of it. And you know, I, I can tell you in in our first. Uh, in our first deals, we've already seen it, so so it's out there. Um, that's you know, those are the places where people are getting started with us today. You know, and, and is this interesting? And, and, and you're right. I, I don't see a ton of it, but if I'm going to repatriate, I don't want to go backwards. I don't want to repatriate to legacy. So it actually does kind of make sense that I repatriate to uh, essentially a, a component of on-prem cloud that's managed in the cloud. That that makes sense yeah. to me. To, to buy, yeah. but today you're managing from the cloud, you're managing on-prem infrastructure. Maybe, maybe you could show us a little leg, share a little roadmap. I mean, where, where, where are you guys headed from a product standpoint? All right, so I'm, I'm not gonna uh, go too far on a limb there, but obviously, right? So one of the key benefits um, of a, a cloud managed platform is this, is this notion of a single API, right? We talked about how the distributed um, edge where you know, think a retailer that has you know thousands of stores, each store having local infrastructure, and you know if you think about the the challenges that come with um, you know just the uh, you know administrating those systems, rolling out firmware updates, rolling out um, updates in general, monitoring those systems, etc. Et right. So having a, a a single console, a cloud console, to administrate all of uh, that infrastructure. Um, obviously, you know the benefits are are easy now. Um, if you think about if you think about that and spin it further, right? So um, um, from a you know from the use cases and and the and the types of users that we've seen and, and Craig talked about them at the very beginning, um, you can think about this is this is a hybrid world, right? Um, you know, customers will have data that they'll have in the public cloud. They will have uh, data and applications in their data centers and at the edge. Um, obviously, uh, it is our it is our objective to you know deliver this, the same experience that they gain from the public cloud on prem, and um, eventually, you know those two things um, can come come closer together. Um, apart from that, right, um, we're constantly improving the data services, um, and as you mentioned, ARM is is on a path um, that is becoming stronger and faster. So obviously, we're we're going to leverage on that and build out our data storage mm -hmm. services. Um, and um, you know, become faster. Mm -hmm. But really, the 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 key thing that I'd like to um, 
to mention all the time, and, and, th and this is related to roadmap, but would rather feature delivery, right? So this is the majority of, of what we do is, is in the cloud, our business logic in the cloud, the capabilities, the, the things that make the infrastructure work are delivered in the cloud. And, um, you know, there it's provided as a service. So compared with your, your, your Gmail, you know, your, your cloud services one day, um, you don't have a feature the next day you have a feature. So we're <laughs> continuously uh, rolling out new, new capabilities through our cloud. Yeah. And, and, other, and, and that's other... about feature acceleration as opposed to technical debt, which is what you get with legacy features, feature creep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. The other thing I would say too, is a big focus for us now is to help our customers more uh, easily consume this this new concept, and we've got, you know, we've already got, you know, uh, SDKs for, you know, things like, you know, uh, Python and PowerShell and and some of those things, but um, we've got, I think, nearly ready, um, uh, an Ansible um, SDK. We have, you know, we're we're trying to. Uh, help folks better, uh, you know, kind of use case by use case, uh, spin this stuff up within their their uh, uh, organization, their infrastructure. Because again, part of our objective, uh, we know that <clears throat> IT professionals have, you know, a, a, a lot of uh, inertia when they're, you know, moving stuff around in their own data center. And, you know, we're aiming to make this, you know, a much simpler, more agile experience to deploy and grow over time. Guys, we got to go, but Craig, quick company stats. I, 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 am I correct? You've raised uh, just under 20 million. Where are you on funding? What's your headcount <laughs> today? <laughs> I am going to plead the fifth on all of that. Uh, oh, okay. Keeping stealth. <laughs> Keep it staying a little stealthy. I love Absolutely. it. Absolutely. All right, yeah. guys, really excited for you. I, I love what you're doing. It's really starting to come into focus. Uh, and so congratulations, I know you got a ways to go, but uh, Tobias and Craig, appreciate you coming up on theCUBE today. Right on. All right, nice and time. thank you for watching this CUBE conversation. This is Dave Vellante, we'll see you next time.